Thank you, Kathy, and uh, welcome to today's session. I know this is toward the end of the day, so thank you for investing some time to come and learn about uh, the cloud and about radiology, and most importantly, what's happening in the world of, uh, of medical imaging and, and AI. We've got some fantastic panelists that I'm excited to introduce you to very shortly. Just a brief way, uh, background of, of introduction to myself. I'm a UK trained radiologist by background and I work uh, with, in AWS for the International Public Sector Health Organization. Uh, what I do within uh, AWS is actually work uh, internationally with our academic medical center communities, hospitals, diagnostic networks, and health research organizations. Some of you attended the previous session, uh, which featured some of the work we're doing with Genomics England and the UK Biobank. So these are all uh, customers that I'm uh, very close to and working uh, globally to try and really understand how a community of academics and researchers, particularly in medical imaging, can kind of come together and share and collaborate. So we're gonna be talking a little bit about that today. Um, my, my background, uh, in, in addition to clinical imaging, has uh, been in industry for uh, over 15 years, particularly working in uh, the medical uh, AI space for the last six years of it. Uh, I was the, the medical director for AI at GE Healthcare, and prior to that, was chief medical officer of an AI startup. And both of those roles, I had the opportunity to work with Sharmila and her team uh, at UCSF, so it's great to have her here. So the focus of today's uh, discussion is really around advances in medical imaging and medical imaging research, and particularly around the, this topic of, of AI, which has really uh, come to the forefront within the, the subspecialty uh, of radiology. Um, I, I am really excited about the individuals that we have with us today. Three luminaries from both coasts. So we have Maryland and DC, and kind of DC, Maryland, and San Francisco represented here. And, and the way that we've tried to design this session is to kind of give the, 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 the perspective and the voice of the different players and, and uh, stakeholders within the clinical research arc. Uh, so if you think about the, the, the bench to bedside story and concept, we've got uh, national bodies represented here who really guide and support and help fund a lot of clinical research and innovation um, in, in clinical, uh, clinical therapies and, and uh, medical devices and treatments. Uh, the uh, voice of the Academic Medical Center, uh, who uh, received the grant uh, awards and, and used that to really drive uh, cutting edge research uh, in, in our space in particular. And then finally, the voice of the clinicians who are really delivering care using some of the research that comes out of these centers. All of the individuals here I need to qualify are incredibly grounded in the academic world and community, but they are going to speak a little bit from the perspective of how I've laid it out from, from national bodies, AMCs, and to providers. Um, I'd like to just quickly introduce them, and then I'm going to let them uh, kind of uh, warm up with, uh, with, a, with a question so you can get to know our, our, our panelists. But let me introduce you, uh, first of all, to Dr. Kevin Farahani, based here in D.C. He is the Program Director for Biomedical Imaging Informatics with the NIH's National Cancer Institute. Dr. Farahani leads the Imaging Data Commons, which I think we're going to talk about today, which connects researchers with publicly available cancer imaging data and other types of cancer data via the cloud. His current research interests are in the application of data science and AI in biomedical imaging. Dr. Sharmila Mujandar is Professor and Vice Chair for Research in Advanced Imaging in the Departments of Bioengineering and Therapeutic Sciences at the University of California, San Francisco. Dr. Mojamdar's role uh, includes leading and supporting a lot of uh, efforts in medical imaging AI across uh, multiple departments and with the recently established Center for Intelligent Imaging at UCSF, which I think she'll be talking about today. And then finally, Dr. Elliot Siegel is Professor and Vice Chair at the University of Maryland School of Medicine in the Department of Diagnostic Radiology. He also serves as the Chief of Radiology and Nuclear Medicine for uh, the Veterans Affairs Maryland Healthcare System. And under his leadership, and I think this is a really exciting, at least milestone for many of us in radiology, the VA Maryland became the first digitized healthcare system in the world um, using PACS. Um, and Dr. Siegel is also a globally recognized uh, researcher and a thought leader in the use and the safe use, I should qualify, of AI and medical imaging. Thanks. And he'll provide some of that voice. 
So what I'd like to, to start off doing, and we'll just start with Kevin and go across, is I'd, I'd, I'd like to just do a warm-up question to let you each kind of talk about what excites you uh, the most about medical imaging research at the moment. And we'll talk about some of the functions and how the technologies are enabling that in just a minute. But I think just to get a flavor of your interests and what excites you. <clears throat> oh, thank you, Chris. Thanks for the question. So uh, as you mentioned at the National Cancer Cancer Institute, I lead the efforts in development of the Imaging Data Commons, which is a cloud-based repository of uh, de-identified images. And it's part of a larger uh, enterprise of cloud-based enterprise of uh, data repositories and tools called the Cancer Research Data Commons. So um, what I find exciting is the, the ability to, uh, to be able to provide these data sets in an AI-ready fashion to the user community to allow them to be able to develop tools, uh, machine learning or uh, AI tools, and also be able to combine these data with other omics, such as genomics, proteomics, and make discoveries in, in cancer. Thank you, and Charmilla. <clears throat> so, um, you know, it's well known that the repositories, clinical repositories in radiology have vast amounts of imaging data. So it's obvious it should be a great resource for machine learning and artificial intelligence. But at UCSF and at the Center for Intelligent Imaging, one of the things that we are focusing on, which is really exciting, is AI could be used across the entire life cycle of imaging. From the minute the patient comes in, deciding on the protocol, exactly what kind of imaging, how the images are to be acquired, reconstruction techniques, noise reduction techniques, then actually extracting more quantitative biomarkers from those images and then using them in addition to the electronic health records to actually solve transformative problems, cancer being one. There are others, of course. I have a special love for musculoskeletal diseases. So I think the entire application of machine learning across the entire gamut of imaging, I think, is the most exciting thing today. Thank you. And finally, Elliot. <clears throat> and so, um, Chris, you know, I, I think we're at a really interesting crossroads right now, and I think that's what has me really excited for right now. I've kind of, during my career, sort of been Forrest Gump, where I've been, you know, uh, um, able to participate in some really interesting kind of breakthroughs in, in imaging, and what I've really enjoyed doing is being disruptive. You mentioned the first uh, filmless or digital radiology department. That was almost 30 years ago. And then the opportunity to work inside NCI, to be able to create the National Cancer Image Archive, to work with the Jeopardy team when they actually played Jennings and, and Rudder for um, essentially, you know, the um, uh, uh, Jeopardy match and, and uh, supremacy at, at that particular game. And what really strikes me is here we are in 2022, after 30 years after, you know, we created a digital department with the idea of being able to have the computer help us in being able to detect disease and make recommendations, et cetera. And for the most part, we don't have that. And so there's this incredible chasm between the you know, wonderful work that Shermila was talking about and, and Kevin was talking about also, and what I have in clinical practice. And so what really excites me is being at the crossroads now where I do believe that in the next five years or so, we will be able to have a significant um, advance in being able to actually apply these in a real clinical world in a clinical practice. And so I'm really looking forward to that and looking forward to the panel discussing some of those opportunities and challenges. Right. And uh, that, that, that's a great setup for, for what we're going to explore today. I do want to, uh, for, the, for, for the first question really that I want to uh, dig deeper on now, I want to set a little bit of context too for the audience here. Because I think it's important for those of you who are not familiar with the radiology community or the medical imaging community to really understand that, that radiology has been at the forefront of digitization, as Elliot was saying, you know, 30 years ago, the, the first filmless hospital emerged. Uh, EMRs came a little bit later on the back of that. So radiology really has been uh, a, 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 an innovative and a digital first uh, subspecialty within the profession uh, for, for, for a long time. And I think it's not a surprise that radiology has also positioned itself at the front and medical imaging, and I caveat that too. But med medical imaging has been at the forefront of the machine learning revolution. Um, and in fact, if you go back to uh, the, the, the first RSNA, which is the Radiological Association of North America conference, 
where AI started to be talked about, that was only in 2016, and there were four topics on the, the, the science uh, agenda related to AI. I gave one of those, actually, on behalf of GE. I, I uh, looked back just to see. And now, uh, after uh, uh, a, a number of years and COVID, the, the, the last uh, scientific uh, agenda at RSNA this last year had over 76 uh, different sessions that were all dedicated to it because the, 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 the community has really embraced it. One thing that I do want to um, also comment on and it's just referencing an academic paper that uh, the University of Zurich published back in 2021 last year to, to again give you a little bit of understanding of what radiology is doing and, and how fast it's accelerating machine learning products. They did a, a, produced a literature review looking at all FDA and CE mark approved uh, medical devices in the AI space, so all AI applications. And I think what was interesting is they, they came up with a total of 220 FDA cleared products between the years of 2016 and 2020, and 240 CE marked products um, over that period. But if you then break it down in terms of the applications, uh, the number of radiology products represented 58% of those that had gone through clearance uh, uh, under FDA and 53% under CE mark. So what that really means, again, it's just a little bit more evidence to support that this is why we're talking about radiology because the images really have a lot of information in them. It requires a lot of effort and compute, which we're gonna talk about in storage to be able to do things with them. But there's a lot of excitement about what has been done and what still needs to be done. So with that background, I'd really like to ask the panel to start off and, and give us a little bit of understanding of why radiology. <laughs> so we, we've, I've provided some context to it, but from each of your perspectives, why is it that medical imaging has, has really embraced this and is pushing the envelope in medical imaging AI? I, um, certainly farther and faster than the other specialties. And maybe think about the, you know, some of the clinical and uh, technical drivers and even economic drivers behind that. Well, maybe I can start from the uh, basic development side. Uh, I think much of the advances in uh, imaging AI and radiology is really owed to a lot of developments in computer vision and then um, the task of radiology being essentially a computer vision uh, uh, combined with uh, you know, understanding of disease, underlying disease, et cetera. So, and then the workflow in radiology, I think, lends itself well to, uh, to AI development. Because a lot of the development in AI we see in radiology are either on the diagnostic side or workflow optimization. Absolutely. And Chair Miller, your perspective. My perspective <laughs> is uh, perhaps a little bit different, but it is computer vision, but it's extremely difficult to translate computer, computer vision uh, techniques into the clinic. It's technically challenging. You need PhD students to do the work and all of that. What machine learning has done is it's en enabled translating some of these techniques to make it completely automated. So imaging is not utilized to its fullest extent in the clinic. And I hope that Elliot will agree with me much of the quantitative information that is stored, it is not extracted because it's difficult to extract it without technical tools such as computer vision and image processing. Furthermore, the number of images that the radiologist sees is increasing. Number of slices, number of contrasts, etc. No radiologist can sit and scan through and collate in a reasonable time frame all the information that's ingrained there. What machine learning promises and promises to deliver is quantitative biomarkers to the clinic as well as a complete integration of all the information that is contained in the images. And there is plenty more to be done. And I think that's what's, for, I think that's what's pushing the researchers to try and deploy this and get this into clinic as soon as possible. Yeah. So Sharmila's response is a great segue to how things need to look when they get into the hands of the users, i.e. the clinicians and the radiologists, and what that impact on patient care looks like. Uh, Elliot, I'd love your perspective. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. I mean, first of all, I think part of your question is why radiology? And radiology has always embraced technology. I mean, it's one of the things that to me is a kind of a computer science uh, a student and who worked through medical school doing computer projects attracted me to radiology in the first place. And I mean, I can remember when we set, um, set up the world's first um, PAC system, it was before there was an electronic medical record, before the hospital even had a network. I had to um, essentially lay the wire in the hospital because there was no network. And so radiology has really, you know, preceded the electronic medical record. I, I agree with the idea that um, uh, 
computer vision has really um, led the way with neural networks and convolutional neural networks that we you know, are referring to as AI. And I think to a large extent, it's been images. And to Sharmila's point, the thing that's really important is that every image that we take, let's say a chest radiograph, contains a universe of information inside of it. So I may read it as a negative chest radiograph, or I may suggest that there's a right lower lobe pneumonia, but really there is an incredible amount of data as far as the size of the heart, the various chambers, um, bone density, and hundreds of other variables, and that's all stored inside the pixel information. And the question is, how can we extract that in such a way that it becomes machine intelligible and then it could be utilized for patient care in all sorts of different ways. And that's, that's a fascinating amount of information. We, we talk about data associated with genomics being really large, but all the different possibilities of these um, imaging studies that we do in multiple different modalities has an incredible universe of data. And I think that's yet to be discovered at this point. I agree, <laughs> and that's why I became a radiologist too. I, mm -hmm. I, I think a lot of us are attracted mm -hmm. by the technology initially yes. and looking that they looking to the when we were choosing specialties, uh, wanted to be in one that was innovating, uh, and then I find that a common theme amongst many of my my radiology colleagues. Well, that that, that, that gives you a little bit of a of an understanding of, of of the drive and the motivation here, which is largely down to, to technical capability, but also the, the opportunities to really improve and, and innovate in healthcare, which is what, what um, machine learning in particular and medical imaging research is trying to do. Um, if, if we move on now to, from opportunities to challenges, uh, I'd, I'd like us now to, 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 to face a little bit of the, <clears throat> of the cold fr front winds that we sometimes uh, have to, to run up against as we're starting to think through what it is that we can actually deliver versus uh, what we're able to deliver today. And, and, and I've, uh, as I laid out at the beginning, I'm gonna go through and get some slightly different perspectives and address the questions a little bit differently here. I'd like to actually start with Sharmila for this question and really thinking from the perspective of the academic medical centers and the tools and the, and, and the technologies that you have available now to be able to conduct research in medical imaging and particularly in AI. What are some of those key challenges that your team faces and think, and, and as you think those through, I'd, I'd love you, um, and, and I'll ask this of all three of you, but I'd like you to think of what is it that cloud can help with based on some of those challenges? What are some of those functionalities that cloud brings to accelerate potentially research and innovation? So for any AI, any machine learning algorithm, the most important thing is data, is well curated, well annotated data. But the data that is used to train the algorithm can also bias the algorithm based on the population which, from which it is derived. It can also bias the model from the basis of what kind of imaging equipment has been used because much of the imaging equipment information is also stored in the images. So ideally, to make a generalizable algorithm, you would want to have data from various sources or have your model trained continuously using different types of data. In doing so, what a researcher needs is access to other data. The biggest challenge here, at least in my mind, is dealing with each of the institutions, their data sharing, material transfer agreements, and data use agreements. This is where cloud share, sharing, federated learning, and other things can be used to develop more robust models. That's one aspect, so date from the perspective of the data sharing. The other aspect that really becomes important is say there is a center that's clinically really savvy and has all the imaging data, but they don't have the technical wherewithal to fire up the systems, keep them upgraded, and keep going. That's where I think the role of cloud computing comes in, whereby all they really need to do, they don't need to fire their own GPUs, they don't need to know very much, but they can actually be contributing data and participating in developing models. The third thing is data security. We are under significant pressure to not have data, even if it's de-identified. We've de-identified data, we've got certification, but you don't want each individual investigator to have a hard disk in their, on their desk, which gets lifted, or in their backpack, because that leads to police investigations, investigations at the university. So under those circumstances, having a secure repository is really a great idea. But what are the challenges? I have my data in the cloud, it's in a repository. I have my algorithm running. My grant has funded it for five years. My grant funding runs out. Who supports it then? 
So will the NIH, will the funding agencies, how do we sustain, keep these models and this data in a sustainable manner? That's a big challenge, and we have to think through it. The other thing is that the cloud cannot be let, you cannot let your students loose in the cloud to just fire up GPUs and keep running. You can run up an enormous bill. So having sort of a scratch play yard or some kind of mechanism where you can be doing sort of testing development is also pretty important, I think. So I've given you sort of the academic version and I guess <laughs> I'll leave it to Elliot and Kevan to fill in the rest. Good. Well, I'm going to uh, pick up on a couple of your points and go to yeah. Kevin next, yeah. too, and offer sort of the, the NIH and the yeah. NCI perspective here, too. Um, Kevin, you, your, your organization provides the, the guidance um, and sometimes in some cases the data through the uh, Imaging Commons data uh, platform that you've set up and also guidance for how PIs work with that data and how they conduct research. What are, what are some of the challenges that you have faced, both in terms of setting up um, the, the, the data and making it available, and also some of the challenges of, of providing access that, um, that Shermil is addressing to those data sets that are really uh, important for the, for the principal investigators to have access to. And then again, as part of your response, if you could try and think through too, what, what, is, what is cloud enabling uh, you to do differently to address those challenges? Okay, I'll try to keep all this. <laughs> so, um, thanks. Uh, so the Imaging Data Commons provides the identified um, images of cancer, both in radiology as well as digital pathology domain. And uh, thanks to the success of the Cancer Imaging Archive, which has been around for 10 years, it's another NCI-supported repository of images. Um, all the data from TCIA are currently in IDC, Imaging Data Commons, and we curate data from TCIA every month on a monthly basis uh, and updating the collections, as well as getting data from other uh, NCI driving projects such as the Human Tumor Atlas Network or Childhood Cancer Data Initiative, et cetera. Uh, one of the biggest challenges in creating large image repositories for public use is uh, the identification that uh, Sharmila uh, referred to. And uh, we're finding that there are different understanding and methods of image de-identification and they may not, not all be the same and they may not satisfy the, uh, necessarily the HIPAA requirements, which is the, the guiding principle for image de-identification. So um, we are looking at cloud-based techniques uh, developed by AWS, Google, and others uh, for being able to de-identify images uh, at scale in the cloud and, and also deploy uh, ongoing active training on the data sets and the de-identification process in order to improve that. Um, that process. We are at the early stages of that um, project and we've operated on uh, the identifying synthetic data, but we're moving to working with actual PHI, protected health information, real images, mm -hmm. and, um, and I'm uh, reasonably optimistic that we'll, uh, we'll be able to get there uh, in, in a relatively short time. Um, but the next uh, step is then curation and quality assurance of the process. And then once you have the identified data, Really, for AI readiness, you need uh, solid ground truth annotations of data set. For most uh, ML applications, not for certain deep learning uh, networks. Uh, so these are some of the immediate challenges as far as making the data sets AI ready. And But the advantage of large data sets in large archives is that we collect this data from some of the clinical trials which have curated data uh, through a very elaborate process of data acquisition and, and making sure that uh, diversity demograph patient demographics and uh, acquisition systems uh, are taken into account. So they have that advantage over federated models that, that work on uh, data sets from a particular institution. And that in and of itself is one of the important components of building models as we've heard in some of the other sessions and that's kind of where the, the, the cold face of uh, taking these tools and implementation uh, also is an important. So to get your perspective, Elliot, as you think about putting these tools in the hands of the clinicians and, and the decision making that is going to be involved with patient diagnostics on that pathway, help us understand what challenges you see, because this is still a kind of a, a story to be told. We know that there are pilots going on globally uh, with a lot of these being used on patients with patient oversight. But help us understand what some of those key challenges are, and is there a role for cloud to try and help um, uh, with, with both the deployment and potentially with the monitoring of, uh, of these solutions? Right, so you mentioned pilot, but I'm gonna use a different sense of the word pilot. In, in many ways, I'm kind of the pilot of uh, my race car. And um, 
these guys are developing really excellent algorithms. They're designing my car. I've got to drive the car. And one of the challenges that we have currently uh, as a radiologist trying to utilize these algorithms is each of them is fairly narrow. And so there's an algorithm to find lung nodules, an algorithm to look at rib fractures, and out each one of these has a fairly narrow function. And as you mentioned, there are hundreds of different algorithms that are out there. The challenge that I have is I don't have a mechanism to be able to test out and consume all of these different algorithms. Um, it's unwieldy. It's easy enough potentially to do one algorithm, difficult to do two or three because I have to integrate it into my IT system and into my workflow. And so, you know, one of the analogies that I use as far as what a radiologist does and how a radiologist uses these algorithms is kind of like if you had an, a self driving car, which I do, and I have a self driving car that updates itself over the cloud on a regular basis by adding additional features. Now one feature might be person avoidance if there's a pedestrian, or another might be staying in the middle of the road, or another might be dog avoidance, or, or um, you know, braking rapidly. Um, if I had a separate system that I had to purchase for my car in a separate um, server in the car that would ring an alarm or a bell every time a cat crossed the road in front of me or I went away from the road and each one of them were separate systems that I had to buy separately, it would be completely unwieldy. And so what I really need is a platform and that platform to be able to allow me to be able to consume or test out all of these different possible algorithms that I have. And so the biggest challenge I have is actually integrating these al algorithms into my um, workflow. And if you know, I'm driving and I'm paying attention to the road and I drive in a certain way, it has to come to me as part of my regular driving experience. It can't make me look behind myself or, or to the side or do something different. And that's really the biggest challenge. And the ability to deliver all of these in a unified, integrated um, way over the cloud is clearly the only way to go. I mean, if someone only has two or three or four applications, they can run those locally, maybe purchase those locally, figure out how to integrate it. But really what I need is a seamless integration where I can continue to update, I can continue to have the system learn, I continue to add new features and functionalities into my workflow. That's impossible without the cloud. It is. And I even came, came away from a trip uh, last month to the UK where I saw a leading academic institution who's deploying in a prospective piloted fashion at the moment over 12 applications. Each vendor has to bring in their server, find a home for it within the on-premises data, uh, data center within the organization and they've run out of capacity. And it's slowing down innovation, slowing down their ability to actually take this out. Because this orchestration piece is, is really a challenge. Uh, and, and, and I do think that, that there is a role for cloud. I, I pick up uh, on your point, but I think it's, it's something that, that we need to explore. And, and, and 12 applications might get me one-tenth mm -hmm. of the way through what I need to know when I'm interpreting a chest CT scan. And yeah. so, you know, as time goes on, there's really a tremendous number of functions and algorithms I'm going to need in my practice routinely to be able to really bring this to clinical care. And I, I think you're absolutely right with your example. Yeah. So lots of challenges, um, lots of opportunity, lots of challenges, and cloud potentially providing some solutions and answers to that. But at the same time, we know in the healthcare profession that uh, we are very risk averse and we're slow to adopt new technologies uh, for, for a lot of the right reasons. Some of it is uh, are reasons that we don't really understand and so we put up barriers to that. Um, I, I'd, I'd love as the next kind of round of questioning, let's start with um, you, Sharmila, on this one. What are, what are the barriers to cloud? You've pointed out a couple of things, you know, putting these in the Ferraris in the hands of multiple different uh, researchers has, has some risk associated with itself. But what are, what are those barriers to adoption? And can you think of some examples, too, of, of how maybe you've thought through or, or uh, some of your researchers have thought through how to overcome some of those to, to be able to move towards cloud? I think the researchers overall are very inclined to move towards the cloud because one of the reasons being that today if you're in the San Francisco Bay Area, to keep your on-prem uh, systems going with system engineers, etc., in the academic world we can't compete with industry. 
So finding the appropriate technical people to keep up the systems as well as have them maintain your systems in an ongoing fashion has become incredibly difficult. And with the security issues that I mentioned, the old world uh, idea that we had that you let a few graduate students lose to manage your systems is being slowly dispelled. So under those circumstances, I think researchers are willing to adapt themselves to actually go into the cloud. I think that's no longer, it's not a barrier from that perspective. I think the biggest barrier in terms of a PI's mind ends up being what are the fun financial implications for me? The financial implications mean use of the cloud on a regular basis. Many argue that on-prem systems and a system which they buy is, is just a fixed cost and there isn't an ongoing cost. Cloud computing can be expensive. Not even when the grad student is renegade and runs away with the cloud, but also it can be expensive as a whole from that perspective. When you put it into an NIH budget, it becomes an issue. Buying a piece of equipment has one meaning, and you can say you will sustain that data. We talked about that just a little while ago. I said, how do you keep it going once your grant is gone? That's another, another question that people come up with. So I think these are the, you know, the researchers really want to get the bigger bang for their buck for the amount of money that they've got. They want to be able to do their research even when the funding is over in between two funding cycles. So these are some of the challenges that researchers face. Having all the tools available and being able to do exactly what you would like, I think in some imaging applications can become a challenge, but I think that with collaborations with the cloud vendor, we can solve those issues. I think they can be solved moving forward. But I think people need to feel, researchers need to feel some form of comfort that the transition that they make to the cloud is not going to be expensive, it's not going to hold them back moving forward, because we live a life where our funding goes away for a period of time. We are used to those dry months, and that's where I think is the concern. Kevin, let's, uh, let, let's hear from you on that. I, 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 I know you sit within the NIH, within your role in particular, so a lot of the things that Sharmila is describing are how the, uh, how the PIs have to uh, actually use the resources that are handed to them from the, from the NIH. How, what is the NIH's perspective on, on, on use of cloud for research and, and, and some of those challenges that she's describing? And, and do you have any thoughts about what the NIH is thinking going forward to look at the, 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 the opportunities that cloud provides over the historical kind of legacy approach where they, the PI puts a budget into the, the application and then uses that to buy hardware. Hardware, as, as you've commented to previously, Sharmila, uh, often goes in lots of different directions at the end of the grant um, and might be less secure or not even less, or not even sustainable in, in terms of where it ends up. So. Um, Kevin, what are your thoughts on that? Sure. Um, so about four or five years ago, NIH uh, started this uh, initiative called the Strides Initiative, uh, which is a partnership with uh, major cloud providers, uh, starting with uh, AWS and Google, and about a year ago, uh, Microsoft Azure also joined uh, Strides. And the uh, um, idea is to, uh, to work with cloud providers and the research community to modernize the biomedical uh, computation infrastructure for research. Um, and um, the, the idea of Strides is to lower the barriers for uh, transition to cloud for biomedical compute, both for uh, storage of data and also for computation. Um, and there are various, uh, you know, sub-initiatives that, that are uh, arising from uh, Strides, such as a new uh, recent initiative is the concept of cloud labs uh, to allow new users or, or even experienced users to uh, to experiment within the uh, confines of a uh, you know three month period uh, with cloud tools and provide feedback to uh, to NIH. Uh, uh, so so Strides is part of the NIH uh, uh, strategy plan for uh, data science, uh, which is a, uh, run by the Office of Data Science and Strategy at NIH. Um, so I find it that researchers are. Uh, some are very interested in cloud, but, but the, there's a bit of an anxiety in some uh, related to factors that uh, Sharmila mentioned about uh, the, the cost of cloud and the runaway cost if, if the graduate student leaves the virtual machine open or running over a weekend and they get hit with a, with a large bill, 
or, um, or what happens to the data sets if the, the grant funding ends. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, um, I think my colleagues at NIH are working actively on these uh, issues. Um, there may be measures such as, you know, uh, strides or cloud providers working with, uh, with high performance computing centers at each of the research institutions to, to provide the level of assurance and, and backup to, to individual uh, PIs that are at their institutions to, to, to sort of lower this, this anxiety about uh, unknowns about uh, cloud. We also need to develop cost models for, for doing research in the cloud. So I find it that the use of cloud for business applications is different than uh, biomedical research and it's also different than clinical work and, and they all have their own priorities, sets of priorities and use cases and levels of understanding and engagement with, with cloud and with computation and, and so it's not a one size fits all but, uh, but we're, I think we're at the beginning of this journey and it's only three or four years into it so we are learning and improving uh, the process. Hopefully. Yeah. Very helpful points, thank you. So let's, let's go now into the, into the real world. <laughs> Elliot, when you think about hospitals and provider organizations that um, are, are contemplating those, that pathway to cloud, we've had a number of uh, conversations around that, including today uh, the Tufts Medicine uh, presentation in our keynote, so we understand what large enterprises are thinking and some who are even taking that step. Help us understand just in, in general what, that, what those barriers look like from your perspective at your institution or what you're hearing across, uh, 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 across the U.S. Sure, so I guess to start out with the obvious, there's the question about patient privacy and security. And uh, the whole idea of moving data to the cloud really you know, um, puts the hospital lawyers and the hospital administrators you know, on edge as far as, well, gee, we don't wanna be on the front page of the New York Times you know, for a, a large security breach as far as the cloud goes. And, um, I think that security is probably um, the number one issue. The other issue is that hospitals have tended over time to create their own storage infrastructures and IT infrastructures, and it takes time to change the culture of storing data locally rather than in the cloud. I mean, the, the studies that I've done and have looked at suggest it's less expensive to actually store data in the cloud, but I think it depends on the type of storage, how often you're going to be accessing the data. Most of the data that we have in diagnostic imaging is pretty much write once and read very infrequently. And so um, that can be really incredibly inexpensive. The other issue is that idiosyncratic to medical imaging, our um, standard for communication, DICOM, which was essentially predominantly developed in the 1980s and 90s before kind of the next generation of um, uh, security standards and following ones, the DICOM is inherently incredibly um, insecure. And, and because of that, I think there's been reluctance. And I think also imaging data sets tend to be really large. And so the question becomes if I have a 3D mammogram, for example, that has a tremendously large data set, will I be able to get that in time as I need it? If I'm doing surgery on a patient and I have a large data set, will I be able to retrieve that in time and then of course there's the question of loss of connectivity to the cloud also. And so I think there are some great solutions. One solution to that is a hybrid where one has a certain set, subset of data locally but keep the bulk of data in the cloud and dynamically and intelligently essentially uh, um, interact with the data. The other thing is this um, DICOM standard which was developed so many years ago is something that nobody would have come up with in 2022 given the current technology. And so can we rethink um, some of those mechanisms for communicating and storing data, and can we look at ways to be able to make that much more efficient and hence significantly more mature, looking at blockchain and other types of technologies to be able to ensure immutability and to ensure role-based um, access. So um, there are major concerns and barriers, but I'm absolutely confident personally um, that uh, cloud is actually more secure, more reliable, and can be higher performance than what we have currently. Right. I'm going to go to one more question and then we're going to go uh, uh, open up to the audience for any questions. This, th this next one is, is to give you the opportunity to do a little bit of future thinking. Um, all of you have been within the medical imaging space throughout your career and you've seen a lot of these advancements in technologies and now with the onset of AI, which we've discussed today, 
what, what, give us your impression of what, and, and, and again, let's think about the patients for all of you. Uh, let's think, think of the patient perspective and the, the clinician's perspective of, of really what does the, what does the, the outlook uh, hold for medical imaging in five, 15 years from your perspective, and, and, and how does that look and feel for the patient and for, uh, for the clinician? Let's start with you, Elliot, again. Yeah, so I, I'm, I'm really optimistic about the future, and I believe that what's going to happen with medical imaging is a democratization where one has greater access to expert systems in rural areas, in developing countries, and throughout the U.S. I mean, you know, uh, most, many of us are from academic medical centers where there are specialists and sub-sub-specialists, and I think being able to um, have a greater degree of expertise for clinical decision support is um, going to become pretty much commonplace. And I think what's going to happen is we're going to have a much greater degree of combination of multiple different modalities, um, PET combined with CT, combined with MRI, and the ability to be able to have inferences from those. And then I think radiology is going to be much more integrated with AI systems in the rest of the hospital. So, you know, radiology currently is leading with the AI systems, as you said in your introduction, but I think our data needs to be discoverable by everybody else's system, the oncologist system, the nephrologist system. And I think from a democratization perspective that imaging is gonna be much more accessible to non-radiologists who will be able to utilize it for quantitative metrics decision support. I think oncologists will be able to interact directly with data. We'll still have the radiologists doing qualitative reports and, and uh, making recommendations, but there will be much more access um, by everybody to imaging as a resource and that imaging will be much more relevant um, in the future and much more integral to what everybody does. And so I, I'm really optimistic that, you know, with some of the things and technologies we've been talking about, we'll see much greater utilization and dependence on imaging in a manner similar to genomics. And that benefits patients, right? Yes, Bene for sure. Benefits that entire experience, the time to diagnosis, time to treatment, all of those targets that, that, that I know our patients want to hear. Absolutely. Uh, Sharmila, thank you, uh, Elliot. What, what's your perspective? What, is, what does the future hold for medical imaging? I think I'll take it one step further from what Elliot suggested. I think what's going to happen is imaging is going to be the key. It's going to be the crux of all type of disease predictions. You might have uh, be a candidate for being assessed for Alzheimer's, but that same data set, by deriving quantitative metrics from the images, gathering the data, linking it with all the electronic health records, seeking the entire knowledge base outside of and the literature, I think we're going to be able to use imaging to combine imaging with other features, sensor data, my Apple Watch connected with my walking speed data. I think all of these are going to be connected with geospatial localization and is going to be able to predict things which are completely unexpected today. You will find clues when you're doing a heart exam as to what's wrong with somebody's joints and vice versa. And I think that's where the revolution is going to be when the world is going to realize that imaging is at the center of the universe. That's my prediction. I love it. I don't know what our genomics friends would say, but let's. I, uh, <laughs> which, is why, which is why I put but it. But I love it. Thank you, Sharmila. And Kevin. So, um, well, I'd like to broaden the definition of medical imaging to include pathology because yeah, uh, absolutely. now, you know, I hear people talking about medical imaging, and I, after a few sentences, I, I noticed that they're talking about digital pathology, not, not radiology. But, but really, radiology and pathology are really the two, uh, uh, two data points for. Uh, for diagnosis and, and treatment planning and in many diseases. Um, I, I agree with the points that were raised. Uh, you know, maybe in future people could read their own um, medical images through Google. You know, now people diagnose their own diseases by, by Google, but, um, but not just um, kidding aside, I think uh, cloud technologies, I mean, we have access to AI and ML products through our uh, wearables and, and uh, smartphones, and this is, pretty much ubiquitous across the board. And uh, that is a nice thing about cloud that it, it provides, it democratizes access uh, to the most advanced tools and, and elastic compute, et cetera. So uh, I'm optimistic about the future of these technologies uh, with, with proper attention. Thank you, Kevin. And, and, and one more point I'd like to add that, that I probably should have, and that is, is that we think of imaging as something that we do, whether it's pathology or, or radiology, molecular imaging, et cetera. 
when patients are sick or when patients you know, have an emergency or when patients are going to have a procedure. But I think imaging is going to expand to something that's routinely done for everybody and to keep us young and to keep us healthy and to keep us you know, mentally uh, acute. And, and so I think imaging is going to become much more ubiquitous with a lot of new um, indications for imaging that will allow us to continue to um, stay healthy, be healthy, and, and to uh, um, be able to avoid diseases before they happen in the first place. Totally. And that's a, that's a wonderful vision uh, of imaging. I know that those in the professional societies are doing workforce planning and so forth mm -hmm. are, are continuing to think about that and what is needed and how these technologies can help yeah. leverage the, 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 the current capacity and what the new capacity needs to look like. You mentioned workforce planning mm -hmm. and when we made the transition to digital at a workstation, people were saying, well, gee, yeah, you're three or four times more efficient, but that means we only need one third or one quarter as many radiologists, but what's happened is the expectations and the volume and complexity of imaging has come to make that up. And actually, you know, at this point, we really have a shortage of radiologists. And I think as these technologies expand, even as AI makes us more efficient, we're still going to continue to need the same number or, or more radiologists and more, um, you know, uh, healthcare providers in general. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm, we have about five minutes left. Um, if there are any questions, we'll take a couple of questions from the panel and then I've got one rapid fire question at the very end to ask the panelists to go through before we close. Thank you, Kathy. Yeah, about, uh, I think about five years ago, the American College of Radiology was um, uh, conducting a um, normative brain study of 3,000 normal brains. Um, my question to the panel is, how important is it that we start out um, doing imaging of healthy people and healthy organs in order to build models to do machine learning and deep learning in, in order to, uh, for diagnostics. And as a follow-up, um, a question with regards to DICOM. Um, how do we, can we use AI to take a look at the three different major vendors that are producing scanning equipment, Philips, General Electric, and Siemens, and to be able to uh, harmonize the data from those three machines, uh, which are uh, adapting DICOM, but also doing it uh, slightly differently uh, in, in order to adapt to the standards. Thank you. Okay. Sharmila, would you, would you like to take that one? Well, then, then, then Elliot. It's a big, like it's a big question. There's many questions embedded in there. <laughs> so I think yes, it's really important to do normal imaging. But the question is, I think we learn what is normal, because normal for one disease might have underlying pathology which we will learn about. So I think acquiring images in seemingly normal and healthy natural history is going to be really, really important if you're going to use discriminatory tools to distinguish pathology. The other thing is with regards to harmonizing the data across the vendors, there are so many imaging modalities that I think that has to be handled on a piecemeal basis, I think. And what does normalizing mean? Normalizing means also protocols. It's not just the vendors, it's also the users. The users have their own preferences. So I think all of these things are huge. You've alluded to something that really needs to be tackled by the field, and people need to decide how they're going to handle this. At least that's my perspective on it. Elliot. Yeah, I agree. I think those are two excellent questions. The first um, question, you know, I do a fair amount of work and have a strong interest in um, issues related to healthy aging. And how do we know whether somebody is aging in a healthy way if one doesn't have normative data? Anytime we collect data, whether it's spectroscopic data or diffusion tensor imaging or other types of data, the question is always where does this subject fit in comparison to other normals? You look in the literature and they're not normal because we don't image normal patients. And so the idea of doing that is, is a phenomenal idea. It's just a matter of who pays for it and, and what are the costs associated. As far as harmonization, it's a great point because we're seeing a tremendous amount of variability with AI algorithms depending on whether mm -hmm. um, which scanner that is scanned, what the protocol is that is being done. There's a lot of proprietary issues related to image acquisition that, yeah, in other words, I think it's great to have competition between the big um, imaging vendors, but there needs to be a harmonized mechanism where we don't look at idiosyncratic filters or kernels of reconstruction 
um, but we have standard ways of being able to do that. And so there's something halfway between the sinogram or the raw data and the DICOM output data that we ought to harmonize on. And these have been discussions that have been um, ongoing at NIH and in many other areas associated with UPICT and the Kiba um, Quantitative Imaging Biomarkers Alliance. So your point is really well taken. If we're going to be using these algorithms, we have to make assumptions about homogeneity of the way the data were captured, and that is not a valid assumption at this point. To whatever extent we can do that. Um, Tramila was talking about having algorithms be generalizable and be able to make up for those differences, but I'd like to also minimize the differences too and do, do both things. Yeah. Fascinating question. I'm going to wrap up here with a final question, and thanks uh, first of all to our panelists for participating today, for your incredible insights and perspectives given uh, the, the, the rich history that you've had within this space, and we'll think a couple of takeaways. Sharmila, I, I love your point that medical imaging sits at the center in the future, and I think that's important to remember as we think about the kinds of uh, infrastructures and capabilities that cloud can provide to help accelerate that. I think that there are some important messages both around the research communities and some of the ways that uh, organizations like the NHS or NIH are thinking about it and how do we enable research to be faster. You know, my, my, my objective that I try and put forward when I speak with academic medical centers is how do we go from IRB to execution within a day? Wouldn't that be wonderful, Sharmila, if, if the, 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 the researchers could do that? And then Elliot's takeaway from, in my mind is about the car. I'm thinking about the self-driving car that needs to be completely pulled together and, um, and not uh, built with a number of point solutions that are trying to, mm -hmm. to navigate and help the driver. I think those are some great takeaways and that AI is here, it's continuing to evolve and emerge, and, the, and the, the, that it will benefit patients and the workforce in the future. And uh, we're here as, as AWS and, and the cloud to try and help support that. I want to finish with a, a, a rapid fire question and then we'll break if that's okay. Um, one of the things that came up in our prep sessions was to really ensure that there were, there were messages that you would like to communicate back to um, our, our builder groups, um, a lot of the art solution architects and things that are, and, and individuals who are sitting in, to, in the room today. Um, if Andrew, Andy Jassy, who was our CEO, were in the room today, what recommendation would you make to him about how to accelerate both medical imaging research and AI in terms of what we're doing. And again, it's kind of recognizing that although we've got lots of industries represented here at this conference, healthcare, again, is unique and different. And some of that came out in the conversation. So I'd love to know just your 30-second response of what you would advise AWS to do uh, to try and help that journey. Kevin, you want to start? <laughs> um, well, yeah, sure. Uh, I think one of the things that we're very interested to see happen is interoperability across different cloud platforms. Uh, and AWS leading the way in, in cloud technology, that should not worry uh, Mr. Jassy so much, but, but really enabling uh, transitioning across cloud platforms is, is really important for our constituent researchers. Thank you, very good point. I think we've put out some key messages. I think if AWS could uh, basically focus on uh, ensuring the integrative approach, where be it the integrative platform that Elliot was talking about, or the integrating different imaging modalities. Uh, for example, uh, uh, Kevin brought up the issue of pathological images and slides and so on. That's the gold standard. If the gold standard were there and it could be linked to every single thing, I think it would be amazing. Interoperability, generalizability, these are all really important, but from the perspective of AWS, it could be the one that is integrative across imaging modalities, across models, across industry, you know, various constituents and stakeholders. I think it plays a key role in being pivotal in that way. Thank Absolutely. you. Thank you, Sharmila. And finally, Elliot. Healthcare imaging included um, has tremendous constraints because each institution or outpatient center or hospital is its own separate island, whether it's a network or not. And what I would um, ask him to look at would be the possibility of enabling patients and empowering patients 
to have control of their own electronic medical record. For me, of course, imaging would be the first thing that I do, but the idea that I have to go to a different institution and start over with all my information no, just and that I don't have that level of control. If I get into an accident and I go into the emergency department, none of that information is available at that yeah. new emergency department. If Amazon, who everybody seems to essentially have packages coming uh, at their doorstep and, and there's such a high percentage of people who even get healthcare products from Amazon, if they would offer the same thing I get with my email and my calendar and my um, drives, if they would offer a cloud mechanism where I would be able to upload my um, health information and images, I think that would be tremendous. I know that's been tried in the past, but I think in 2022, we're in a different situation than we were 10 years ago. So, brilliant innovation and thinking, thank you. Thank you so much. Can we give our panelists a round of applause and thank you for attending today.